from Miami in the series of Boston Medical uh, TV. Tonight we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Phil Shang, uh, a surgeon from Mass General. He uh, specializes in burn surgery. Uh, he's a noted uh, educator. He travels a lot to uh, Latin America and Africa uh, teaching uh, burn surgeons, I guess, how to uh, treat cases and hopefully we'll touch on that after. Phil's going to give a presentation and then uh, we'll open it up to questions from people that want to tweet a comment or a question. So good evening, Phil, and welcome. Good evening, John. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and good evening to the audience out there. Uh, we figured we kind of go a traditional uh, slide presentation about basics of burn care. Um, we'll go through it pretty quickly and leave plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So I'm going to switch over to my presentation now. Okay. Oops. <coughs> and um, it's uh, yeah, it's up there fine. Perfect, excellent. So this is just basically a basic introduction to burn care. Um, um, basically, we'll talk a little tonight how you would assess the burn when you look at it, what characteristics um, to describe it, so you can communicate to other professionals the seriousness and depth of the burn injury, and talk a little bit about the treatment course of burn injuries, and then. Um, a little bit about the burn centers where I work at. <coughs> Burns are still a pretty significant problem here in the United States. Um, according to the American Burn Association, you get still over half a million people who receive medical care for burn injuries every year. And anecdotally, I can tell you that probably is easily double that number who may get a small burn at home but don't necessarily seek medical care right away. About <coughs> excuse me, 40,000 people every year end up needing hospitalization for their burn injuries. And we still have a pretty significant mortality from burn injuries, almost over 3,000 every year. Um, majority by far from house fires, but also from other um, etiologies as well. So when we're looking at burn wounds, the three questions are the what, how severe, and how big. Um, or in more proper medical parts, like the type of, of burn it was, the depth of the burn, and the percent total body surface area, or percent TBSA for short. And burn types basically go down to the, no pun intended, of course, uh, the type of um, injury that caused the burn injury, whether it be a thermal injury from great heat, chemical burns, electrical burns, or radiation burns. Um, but no matter what type of burn it is, the first step in the process is by far to stop the burning process. Uh, we teach the kids in school, stop, drop, and roll, and that still applies to this day uh, for the flame burns. Um, once, you, once the burn process is stopped, we do encourage um, parents or patients to cool the injury with cool tap water. Ice is actually detrimental. It can cause an intense vasoconstriction that can worsen the injury. So cool water is best. The range of home areas we see people come into the burn unit will amaze you. Honey, toothpaste, spaghetti sauce, paste picante salsa I've seen once. Um, generally, though, we recommend that good old-fashioned tap water is the best and simplest thing by far. Um, so talking a little bit more about the various burn types, we further will subcategorize the heat burns or thermal burns into flame, scald, steam and flash, contact, and hypothermic or cold injury as well. And you can see, I apologize if anyone's eating or has a sensitive stomach or eyes, but these are some examples of the burn injuries you'll see in this pattern. For example, this is a gentleman who suffered direct um, flame injury. His shirt had caught on fire. You can see the deep burns he had suffered on his torso. Um, this is a child who unfortunately had hot liquid poured on, and you can see how um, the burn injury kind of follows a, a spill pattern there. Another example of a scald injury, this time with a child's arm. And then a flash burn or steam burn, where you might imagine, say, someone's working on a car radiator, and a blast of steam will hit them in the face. And this one, you can, the picture speaks for itself, but just in terms of everyday household use, especially in the kitchen, how someone can actually touch a hot surface and have a contact burn immediately. Now, chemical burns are a bit different than thermal burns in that um, we, we re usually recommend uh, prolonged flushing with water um, because the chemical burns can continue to um, progress through the tissue planes as they continue um, to touch it with contact. Oftentimes, patients may present with dry chemicals still on their skin or clothing, in which case it's very important to brush off that dry powder before irrigating copiously. The cute pithy saying is, um, the solution to pollution is dilution. 
And uh, very importantly, as with any potential terrorist agent, it's very important to take precaution as a healthcare provider to protect yourself and the other patients in the vicinity from the chemicals. Um, there have been case reports of patients coming into the emergency room with chemicals, um, toxic, and they've had to eventually shut down the ED because um, someone neglected to uh, properly uh, dilute all the chemicals off before entering the patient. And then electrical burns can actually come in. This is an extreme electrical injury where clearly a high voltage current um, entered through the hand and injured many layers, including the muscles and the deeper tissues in this case. Um, and a radiation burn you know, could be easily, we would classify a sunburn as a simple radiation burn, but there can be other um, radiation sources. Um, sometimes there are, especially in other countries, there can be um, leftover radiation use from other things that are thrown away in landfills and people get accidental exposures from that. Then besides the type of burn, we also like to assess the depth of the burn. This is where we have the classic first, second, or third degree terminology that actually was formulated by a French surgeon, Dupuytren, back in the 1840s. It's pretty amazing that we have a classification system that still is valid to this day, even from the 1840s. Um, a lot of burn surgery, my colleagues, will tend to use the classification you see on the right-hand side, superficial partial thickness, deep partial thickness, and full thickness. But in this day and age, we still interchangeably use the first, second, third degree terminology with the partial thickness to full thickness terminology. And the key here is it helps to visualize the layers of the skin as we talk about these depths of injury. So for example, um, well, so the reason the burns have such an impact on our lives, the, the skin is an amazing organ. It is the largest organ in a, in, in a human being, and it has a number of functions, protection, immune activity, um, helps regulate our body temperature, helps maintain the fancy words fluid homeostasis at the bottom line. It helps us maintain, you know, keep our fluid levels well, um, very important for metabolism, as well as being our sensory um, interface with the outside world. And obviously people judge us on our parents, so it has a social and interactive function as well. And you can see that the skin is not just about skin, it's also about a multitude of important structures that have function. The hair follicles, um, the nerve endings, sweat glands, and the blood supply. Um, there's also small muscles that help um, and cause that sensation of goosebumps when you see your hair standing on end. And all of these things together are important for normal functioning skin. When a burn injury happens, some of these or all of these important suborgans of the skin can be knocked out and lead to very bothersome or even uh, dangerous consequences for our patients. So going through um, the various depths of burn injury, um, a superficial burn or uh, in layperson's parlance, a first degree burn, um, this is what you know we would commonly say in layperson, uh, equivalent to a sunburn. And it can be caused by any of a number of different causes, whether it be a flash burn or a UV light or excessive sunlight or a, a, you know, a low level flame touch. Um, the general appearance is dry, no blistering, no swelling, but red. And these are painful, and they, if you're more patient, they can expect to be painful for about three to seven days, but usually these burns do not scar. So that's something to reassure patients. Typically, treatment for these would be um, like a moisturizer, like aloe vera. The next step, the burn injury, is um, the superficial partial thickness burn, or what we would call superficial second degree burn. Uh, again, multiple etiologies can lead to the same depth of injury, and by far the most um, significant sign for this type of burn is a moist blister. Um, other notes are that these are very painful, and the wound will blanch, which means that you press down the burn wound, and you see that the color changes to white transit as your finger's pressing down. Then when you release the finger, the color comes back within two seconds. That's a good sign that the vascular supply to that area has stayed intact. And it's one of the prognostic indicators that we use in, in the burn field to assess whether a burn has stayed superficial second degree or is converted to a deeper injury. Um, usually we say that these burn wounds take 7 to 21 days to heal. And if they heal in that time, usually there's no scarring. But it can take several days of dressing changes before achieving this result. And any infection that occurs in that initial time frame can unfortunately change that prognosis. And then we talk about deep secondary or deep partial thickness burn wounds. Um, again, multiple etiologies leading to the same result where you have burn injury that extends down to the deeper dermis. Um, these burns initially may present with blisters, but then over the course of hours may actually start changing color to a model red or a scarlet red with poor blanching. Um, these are still painful, but sometimes they are less painful than the superficial second degree. And the challenge here is that these burns sometimes take up to 
three to five weeks to heal. And these are the wounds where scarring starts becoming a possibility. And then finally, the full thickness burn or the third degree burn. This is the burn that looks bad. It's the burn that looks um, has a leathery look to the burned skin. Um, surprisingly, for a lot of patients, it's insensitive. They're always saying, wow, this doesn't hurt. And that's when usually my colleagues know that that's probably not a good sign if there's no pain sensation in that type of burn wound. These are the burn wounds that usually do require skin grafting. Um, for third degree burn wounds that aren't grafted usually take several weeks to months to scar in and are at risk of infection during that scarring in process. Then finally, if after you've assessed the type of burn it is and how deep the burn is, you have to um, provide an estimate how big is the burn, or what we call the percent TVSA. And we have two rules to go by um, that make it relatively easy. Um, in the adult, you can go by what's called the rule of nines, and that involves um, breaking down the parts of the body in nines. For example, the head in its entirety is 9%, each arm is 9%, um, each leg is 18%, but the front of the leg is 9 the back of the leg is 9 and the torso is a multiple of nine. So the interior torso is 18%, the back is 18%, and then that leaves, if you've been adding up the math, basically multiples of 9 times 11, 99% leaves 1% for the perineum, a very important 1%, I will add. Um, and you see it adds up to a total of 100%. And again, this assumes that you've got an adult who's typically about 70 kilograms. Um, this has been actually a point of research of wondering how applicable, how, how accurate is the rule of nines for obese patients. And the answer is not as accurate, unfortunately. Um, so we use this as a quick rule of thumb or say when we're doing the initial assessment of a burn patient. Um, but we do end up needing to find more accurate ways of assessing the body surface area involved in a burn, whether it be direct measurement with rulers or using other means. Um, there are these lung browder charts which are commonly found in most uh, pediatric and adult um, emergency departments which can help you estimate the burn surface area, especially for children, because children do not follow the rule of nines. Another example of a lung browder diagram here. And then the other way which I find useful, especially for burns that are splattered and kind of scattered over the body, is the Palmer method. And this is where um, you use the patient's palm, and by palm, I mean palm and the fingers, but the entire kind of palmar surface, and that equals a 1% TVSA. And this is great, and especially for burns that are discontinuous. And, um, for example, you can use this example, and if that circle represents 1% of the patient's palm size, you can see this burn one adds up to 7% TVSA by estimate. Um, and this is a very e quick and easy way to assess the burn size. Again, the key is to use the patient's palm and not your own palm. Okay. Fortunately, one of the sad aspects of burn care, especially in pediatric burns, is abuse and neglect. And um, this is something we see on average about once every month, every two months, unfortunately, at the Shriners Hospital in Boston. Um, there's certain signs to watch out that should set your alarm bells off if you see a patient with certain patterns of injury. Um, if there's any inconsistency in the story provided by the caregiver or the parent, um, if there are certain clear lines of demarcation, whether it looks like someone may have been dipped in or had their hand dipped into something warm, or if there's branding with hot objects, those, those can be telltale signs that you need to really evaluate for the possibility of abuse, unfortunately. And abuse doesn't just happen in kids. It can happen in adults as well, especially elderly adults or adults who may be developmentally late and unable to protect themselves. Um, in a burn center, um, we found wound management is one of the key aspects of any burn injury. Um, and the general goal of wound management is to prevent or treat infections and to create an environment set, such that healing will be optimized. Um, at the Shriners Hospital, as well as the Massachusetts General Hospital, faster trace and ointment is our standby for um, secondary burn wounds, superficial and even intermediate. Um, the faster tracing is inexpensive. It covers the most common strep and staph bacteria on the skin and um, provide soothing through the Vaseline gauze. And we've found that in some patients, you can even extend the dressing change to every other day. You usually recommend a once a day dressing change with bacitracin and a dry sterile gauze. For deeper burn wounds, we may need to use other um, antimicrobial agents such as sulfamylon cream or, or thermazine or what's called silver sulfadiazine. Um, we usually will refrain from using silvadine or silver sulfadiazine unless the burn wound is a third degree burn wound. 
there are some studies that suggest that sylvadine impairs re-epithelialization of superficial bone. So sylvadine is perhaps not the most appropriate choice for a superficial partial thickness wound, but should be reserved for your third degree burn wounds. And then um, for our inpatients or patients who receive skin grafts, we do what are called topical soaks dressings or wet dressings. And these allow for the same dressing to be kept on the patient for two, three, four days um, while allowing antimicrobial properties to be administered to the bandages. Um, we use silver nitrate, as you can see the bottles here, or solutions of naphthenide acetate or more commonly called sulfamylon. Um, both offer great antibacterial coverage, both have different advantages and disadvantages, and I'm happy to answer questions later on about either. Um, one of the unique features to both burn units in Boston is that we use these bacteria-controlled nursing units for our patients with larger burns. The, the plastic walls help separate the patients from spread and cross-contamination from bacteria from other patients, and each, and inside the wall in the ceiling, you can see, for example, um, ventilation shafts that are unique for each room and provides help with filtered air to further reduce the risk of contamination. Also, we can control the temperature and humidified humidification for each burn patient up to 120 degrees, 100 percent humidity, thus um, maintaining their body temperature more accurately while keeping the nurses outside cool and comfortable. Um, at a, in a burn center, it takes a whole team. It's not just about the burn centers and the nurses. Um, both, uh, both our adult and uh, pediatric burn units feature all these specialists on the teams. Um, respiratory therapists, physical therapists, music therapists, child life therapists in the case of the pediatrics side, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nutritionists, pharmacists. It takes all these experts to get a burn patient, especially one with a large burn, to, um, to survive and to recover most of their function in the post-recovery period. Um, so kind of take a step back to a little bit of that burn it's helpful, I think, to describe what a, a typical burn patient might go through, especially one with a big burn, which we typically will define as greater than 30% total body surface area. There's a phase in which they are in need of acute fluid recession, what we call the shock phase. And then, once they've been adequately resuscitated, they enter the acute phase until wound closure is achieved. Um, one quick rule of thumb we use in the burn world is that for every 1% of total body surface area burned, we expect at least one day in the ICU. So you can imagine, for example, for a patient with an 80% burn wound, that could easily mean two to three months in a burn ICU, and sometimes longer, especially if they have other complications. And then the phase that the patient entered for the premature the remainder of the rehabilitation and reconstructive phase, because currently at this time, we do not have great means to prevent burn scarring. And um, it's not unheard of for burn patients to have literally dozens or even hundreds of surgeries throughout their life to deal with the sequelae of the burn scars. Um, in general, the general principles after we've gotten the patients through the resuscitative phase, it involves multiple trips to the operating room to surgically remove the burned skin and then to cover, to harvest donor skin from available areas and then to use the donor skin to cover the wounds. If we don't have enough donor skin graft available, we'll cover the excised burn wounds with a temporary skin covering. It could sometimes be a pig skin product called Xenograft or even skin donated from cadavers called um, Allograft. And we will repeat this process as donor sites keep rehealing until all the wounds are covered with the patient's own skin. Um, this is an example of the tools we use. This is a larger knife called a Watson knife, which is used to tangentially remove large areas of the skin. This is what we call a gullion or wet blade to help tangentially remove smaller areas of skin. And um, this is an electric knife, a dermatope, that helps us harvest skin from donor sites very evenly. Um, and this allows us much more precise control of harvesting so we can ensure that regeneration of the donor sites happens in a shorter period of time. And then this is a typical example of look after we've placed a fresh skin graft over a, um, a recently harvested, uh, sorry, recently excised area. As you can see, this skin graft here has multiple holes. It looks like a net. It's what we call meshed graft. We've run this through a mesher to create these holes so that the skin graft can cover more area. This is especially important for those patients who have very limited donor area, say a, a patient with a burn of 80% or greater. The meshing allows us to cover more area and and as you can see here. Then once the patients have survived and finished all their grafting, the rehabilitation phase begins. And this involves not just only physical really in terms of helping them walk again or regain their function. It also focuses on scar management from the beginning. Um, we will, throughout, even during the initial hospitalization, our therapists are involved um, placing the patients in splints, 
using pressure garments once they've healed to decrease the scarring, crafting face masks, as you can see in this child in, this, in these pictures here. Um, and scarring. Scars, unfortunately, do happen after burn injury. Our usual rule of thumb is say if a burn wound heals uh, within 14 days, there's usually only about a 1-2% chance of scarring. For burn wounds to take more than 21 days to heal, we start talking about 50% chance, and then by about say about four or five, we're hitting about almost 95% chance of scarring. But generally, scarring will range widely. Some children scar minimally and have minimal raised scars. Other children with the weeks will have very probably raised, very red and purplish looking scars. Um, and it varies. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to predict how each child um, will scar unless they've had a previous injury. We usually describe the scarring process as taking up to a year, year and a half before um, the scars finally mature and settle down. Um, some of the things we do to try to modulate the scarring during this one year period is pressure garment therapy, where we'll have the patients wear pressure garments over the areas that are raised. Um, the benefits are it does seem to help flatten the scars at least temporarily, though some of my more skeptical colleagues will point out if you take off the pressure garments within 30 minutes, the scars will seemingly raise back to their previous height. Uh, we also have other uh, modalities that are used as well as massage, um, special splints and masks, um, silicone gels can be placed over the over the scars. Um, by far, one of the major advances that's been pioneered, especially at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Shriners Hospital in Boston, is the laser treatment of scars. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Rox Anderson, one of the foremost dermatologists in the world, and Matthias Donlin, the chief of staff currently at the Shriners Hospital, pioneered the use of lasers to modulate scars and to help improve the appearance for patients. There are different targets in the scar tissue that are targeted depending on the wavelength of laser light used. A typical laser regimen currently consists of about four to six treatments um, but with two to three months between treatments. So this, we warn patients it can take up to a year to a year and a half before they see significant improvement in their scar appearance. Um, the results are variable, but overwhelmingly in the few studies that are out there, patients overwhelmingly report su subjective improvement and content with um, the appearance of their scars at the end of laser treatment. Um, other aspects of burn care is patient education. Um, we actually feature a full-time school teacher at the Shriners Hospital to make sure the kids don't fall, fall too far behind their school work. Um, and then we actually have re-entry programs to help ease both patients and parents back into their community. Um, in the case of the kids, we actually will visit their school before they come back and have special presentations for their teachers and their classmates so that the, the burn patients won't have to answer all these questions and hopefully we can make it an easier transition for the kids to make it back into their classroom. So one of the missions and one of the joys I have is um, taking care of pediatric burn It can be hard during the acute phase, but as they make their recovery, especially once they're back home in their communities, it is a joy to see how um, much life, you know, how much they can return back to a happy, fulfilling life. Um, you know, there's a number of questions that have been raised over the years, you know, especially for an 89 percent rate. Can they legitimately lead a quality life? Is it worth all the suffering and the resources dedicated to their acute burn care? I think if every 90 percent burn I've ever talked to has said yes. Um, they're able to find a quality, even with amputations, even with the scars. Um, usually most of them have found a, a, you know, a life they consider worth living. So um, a little bit about the burn units I work with, and then I think we'll be able to have time for questions. Um, the Massachusetts General Hospital Burn Center is the adult burn unit. Um, we just moved into a newer unit on last year, about one year ago. I have seven ICU beds, 20 floor beds. It is one of only two American Burn Association verified adult burn centers in New England, and by far it is the oldest and largest adult burn center in the Northeast United States. Uh, this upper picture, you can see one of my colleagues, Dr. Jeremy Government, as well as some of our fine nursing staff at the adult burn unit. And at the Shriners Hospital, which is right across the street from MGH, um, there are four burn hospitals in the Shriners Hospital system, Boston, Galveston, Cincinnati, and um, Sacramento. Um, we are a 30-bed pediatric facility. We have um, an, an acute care unit with four ICU beds, um, eight beds that can also take care of step-down or intermediate-level patients and an 18-bit reconstructive unit. And by far, the overwhelming activity at um, our hospital relates to either acute burn care or reconstructive burn care. And um, I think we'll wrap it up with that. So thank you for your attention. I open the webcast for, for questions.
Well, Philip, thank you for a very uh, comprehensive, clear, and complete presentation of Burns. And I, I just want to introduce uh, quickly Paul Sotek. He's a he's a trauma surgeon from Indianapolis, and he probably and you guys have a, a lot in common because I'm sure he deals with burns, and also he's a glass lover like you. Woo! Awesome. I've hey, Phil, nice to meet you. Um, I don't think I actually ever met you out when I was out there. I was actually there at uh, Pat Donahoe's lab at MGH for three years, right across the street from where you are. Um, so uh, I heard quite a bit about the Shriners Hospital and everything while I was there, and uh, um, it was a really good time. But I don't think I ever got to meet you when I was there. I just joined the staff about three years ago. So I think oh, did you? Yeah, I was there from uh, 2004 to 2007 in Pat's lab. Uh, that were the Simji building. It was a great, uh, great experience. Uh, be glad that you're in that area. I, don't know. You know, I mean, I might as well start off the thing. So, um, I do acute care and trauma here in Indianapolis, and uh, we don't actually do the birds. We have a separate bird center um, that does it here in Indianapolis at the at the county hospital. Uh, Rajit Sood does that uh, with the plastics department, um, but uh, um, one of the things they employ, because uh, as you mentioned, your bacterial control nursing units is a standard type thing or, or similar set, setup for most of these uh, burn units, uh, and obviously the, con the concern is going in and out and you know doing all that stuff to, with the bacterial infection. So have you started using glass? Um, I know that you know VC and some of the other companies have you know apps that people are using the iPad and they're kind of holding it up. But obviously, I think the the next next extension is to use a streaming app for you guys when you're rounding. You talk about those huge teams and and you don't want to go in every room with the whole team. So it would be easy to have a glass for each room. I could see that you know that stays in the room. And uh, and you can just switch between the glasses um, to to look at and the, and direct the nurse guess, to show you the wounds. You know that is a great idea. Um, I had tried at the moment. I only have one glass device, um, and I just use it for the first time last the broadcast in the way you described. I'm I kind of kick was I hadn't thought of it before, but I like your idea because that would definitely limit the. Uh, bacterial transmission to have a glass device in each room. Um, sure, sure, yeah, you know, um, it, it was just, I actually thought about it when John asked me to, to come kind of talk to you because we're, we're actually been working on a, an application. And one of the ways I got involved, and, and John's heard the story before, was uh, uh, being a trauma guy, we're going to put it on all the EMS, and well, how are we going to do a, like sort of a proof of concept? And, and I worked with, uh, out at the Motor Speedway here in Indianapolis as one of the trauma guys. So I said, well, let's try it because we got four crews. Let's put it in four corners. Well, it became very clear that we wouldn't be able to say, okay, the last car going around. Actually, I think this would be a, a nice application for you. Um, and that's what I was thinking. Can you hear me still? <laughs> I can hear you now. I've kind of lost maybe some of that sentence, but I oh. Oh, what I, was, what I was saying is, so we, when we, we were building this application, what we did was uh, um, I can control any number of glasses with an iPad. So you can, and so when I was talking, when I was thinking about, you know, kind of things that we would we could do is it would be really cool for somebody in a burn unit like, like you're talking about to be able to have a glass in each room so you don't have to take them in and out of the room and, and have the nurses put them on. And when you round, you could actually just select the the room number. You could have them by the room number. And I think uh, some of the guys there are actually working on some glass stuff where you could actually uh, uh, probably just walk into the room. <laughs> you know, I mean. That'd be amazing. I'm curious, how, how has your group handled the HIPAA aspects? Because i got to say, my hospital has been really nervous about me using glass in the patient care. I have to go out of my way to reassure every time I put on glass that I'm not recording every second of someone. Yeah, well, you know, Paul, you, you were mentioning that it's just like a camera. Uh, if you don't if you don't hook it up to the internet, it's just like a camera, right? That's for yeah, you know, I mean for recording and things like that. It's no different, you know. And it's very common. Uh, I don't know that it's 100% kosher, but we all know that the plastics guys have been taking pictures and doing stuff for forever. I mean, if you if you do this, you know. I mean, like I mean, I'm not spilling the beans. It's just. Um, that's that's sort of a standard thing. Now, I think we do need to be a little more careful with that. You absolutely definitely need uh, a HIPAA compliant platform, and, and you know we're working towards that with what we're doing. Uh, um, one of the things that if you have a dedicated device um, uh, and you're on a, a a technically compliant network within your hospital, and you're on the hospital network. It, 
sort of under that hip. Did I lose you again? Yeah. A little bit. But you, I, I hear yeah, the question raising yeah. about. Uh, I'm getting a little funky. Uh, what I was just saying is you're you're sort of under the the hospital uh, uh, network. Um, you know, I think yeah, MGH is one one of the the leaders um, uh, over there that have done some of the initial work on some of this. So I, I would suspect there's some guys there that uh, have um, you know some ways around that you could use it. But it is definitely an issue that <laughs> is the first thing that always comes up. But then you got to remind them that you know your cell phone is more powerful than glass. <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just was wondering if you guys had tried that yet or thought about that. Because um, uh, one, one of the things that's nice is, so, like I said, you can uh, basically you have a user account and uh, you can log out any number of glasses and then you go to the um, you go to the website essentially and you can just or iPad and you you pick which one you want. So you could walk around with your team and have the nurse in the room and have their glass and they could be streaming and you could just select the one you want to see. It's also a nice way if uh, you're not there and the nurses are changing the dressing. You said that there was like only once a day that, as I know, as I know, but just point it out. You know, you only try and do it once and it's great if you can do it. The HIPAA issue is something we got to work with though. How's the learning curve for the nursing staff for using glass in that way? Or how, it's how actually could... interesting. An interesting question. Um, you know, th there's two two answers to that question. Uh, um, it's more difficult than you think, actually. I mean, not you, but I mean, like people think. Uh, you know, we we ran a, we took the start triage, which is the mass casualty triage. Uh, algorithm and we've made an app out of it and put it on a thing and took it to nursing students and thought well this is great well they're gonna have it right in front of their eyes they can do this they'll be able to more efficiently I think the 60 to 70 percent is sort of the average how correct you are in, in the real world and so they we're trying to improve that with class and what we found is actually it's significantly improved not a lot but it did not you think it'd be a hundred percent but it was more the technology that they couldn't handle the swiping and the tagging and stuff just like kind of what you're saying um, kind of goes along with what we were doing now we're working out the motor speedway so we, we realized that pretty early on um, that they weren't going to be able to do this when they're taking care of people so one of the things we built into the app that we're, we're working on building um, is uh, actually to be able to control it from the iPad so they don't have to do anything they just got to wear it so you activate it um, and that also allows for more sterile environments and things like that. Um, that. That's sort of a work in progress. We're not there yet, but that was the, the idea is that we built that in so that basically when we had it, I could pick, we had four crews, four different corners, um, you know, essentially. I think I lost you guys. Can you can you hear that okay, uh, uh, Philip? Um, missed the, probably the last three sentences. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. what I was saying is, um, it was so you know so that you can actually control it and turn it on. Um, you know, so if you were walking around rounding in and nurse number in room number two is and you hit number two, it would activate the glass. Is all they have to do is be wearing it and have it on in a standby mode. So they can either activate it when they go in there into a broadcast stream mode or you can activate it from the iPad kind of situation. So um, that's in development right now. Um, you know, it's um, it's close. I mean, we're doing a lab on Monday where I'm going to teach an abdominal wall reconstruction course using four different views. So we'll have four different guys wearing glasses. And this is the this is part of the HIPAA development issue that we're working on developing with HIPAA because um, you know it's it doesn't really it applies, but with the cadavers it's a little bit different. So we're doing a cadaver course to start. You're kind of trying to learn how to do it before we we go full full on with patient care. Well, okay. Philip, you know about pristine, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Philip does know about that? I don't think I've heard of this. Uh, what's what's the story of pristine? It's, it's HIPAA compliant. It's a HIPAA compliant, right, Paul? Yeah. So there's there's a, well, there's a couple that are HIPAA compliant. I mean, uh, the pristine product is called Iden, and essentially what it does is it's a, it's essentially a streaming. You, you sort of tap and, and go. Um, it's just straight up streaming. That would be something where you'd have to. Um, 
you know, go from one room to the other with the glass and take it in and out. You wouldn't be able to look like so. You wouldn't be able to sit at your on your iPhone right. and check different different rooms and stuff like that. It would be a little different. Um, there's a company here locally from where I'm at. It's called Hody Technology, and they actually have a similar application that's uh, HIPAA compliant, uh, um, and uh, and they're doing a very similar thing. Um, but um, it was just I was, didn't mean to kind of get off track. I, I didn't want to interrupt you. It was a great talk, and, and I, I mean, I would love to have that for you know our residents and stuff because I think that it was a very good overview and and sort of given the details of uh, the burn world. I'm fascinated by what you've done with glass. Like it's just um, because I've had, there have been a couple other folks in my department who bought the glass first, but I think everyone's been dismissed, too hung up on the limitations and not seeing the possibility. I'm really excited to see you are looking for the possibilities and how to use it, the really marriage the technology with your team. That's why I find really exciting. That's yeah, pretty- you know, it's one of those things where I think, like you said, you you get disappointed with it when you first get it because you have all these like <laughs> delusional grand, you know, of grandeur or whatever, and then you kind of you're like, oh, I'm going to use it for everything, and then you use it for nothing, and then you use it for everything again, and you kind of go back and forth. So, um, I think you know, honestly, I mean, I think you've got a great opportunity with what you're doing to really. Uh, um, um, you know, change the way that burn care is delivered, and uh, and change the way we're doing it. And I, like I said, are you guys using any kind of app right now for that? Uh, no, I don't have a, I don't have a programming skills I own to really adapt, and I haven't had time to find like a program team. It's crazy. I know Google headquarters in Cambridge is located less than a mile and a half away from my hospital. I just haven't had time to talk with them. Sure. Good sure. time. Uh, uh, this is a different topic. Uh, uh, Phil, you do a lot of traveling to teach uh, burn surgeons in Africa and Latin America, correct? Yes. Do you, do you do that by uh, teaching on the internet, or do you actually physically go there to teach the surgeons? And it's been through partnerships with Physicians for Peace, and after visiting most of these countries, the internet um, infrastructure in some places robust enough to, I think, do some distance learning, but especially these countries, they still value much more face-to-face, so I think it's still helpful, at least for the initial contact, to meet face-to-face, and then I think for future um, uh, interactions, then to be able to use the net communications, but it's a culture that very much values the handshakes and values the face-to-face interaction, at least to establish relationships, but once the relationships um, established, then I think that's where the technologies like the Hangout and the Internet um, video can really help improve ongoing education. Yeah, I think we'll talk about that later. Um, but that's something I think, uh, you know, the world all over is improving in uh, Internet connectivity. But we'll talk about that later. Um, but, yeah, uh, that's one thing I was impressed with when uh, I was involved with Paul with the conference in Google Glass was that uh, – uh, how how widespread it's used in, in, in all different specialties, and not just surgery. Uh, I never did get a chance to talk to Alg Medics. Uh, you know about them, Paul, right? And uh, they, they use it in the office uh, out in California, and they say it cuts down a lot of time. But uh, I guess they have some issues to work out with Dragon. But uh, I guess so. You guys feel it is going to be a uh, a lot of use for it in burn surgery in the burn field. I think so. Like Paul suggested, it's it's a very it's a field you can do a lot of diagnosis with just the visual in, um, information you get from an image. So I think of all the fields in surgery, that's one field I think by far could definitely have a significant impact. Um, one of the curious demographic quirks of burns is that at the moment, the, most of the senior burn leadership is in their late fifties, early sixties, so they're not so in the mood to adapt to new technologies. But there's a pretty big wave of younger burn surgeons coming through training writer who just finished training. So that generation might be much more open to trying devices like glass. But uh, at the moment, the leadership of those places, they look, when I see the AVA conference, they give me a look as if I've got a tumor on my head. So yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess you're, you're in a burn center. How big of an area do you cover in Boston? Do you get patients from all over New England, or is it mostly the Boston area? All the way up to Maine, down to uh, D.C. area, and um, in terms of international coverage, from we have relationships, especially with Honduras, Dominican Republic, and Guatemala. And wow. 
these dogs, the dogs will bring in usually a couple Ukrainian bird patients every year. So we get them from mostly New England, Caribbean, Central America, and occasional one from Ukraine. Yeah, do, do you foresee a use of Google Glass being in a hospital where someone could actually show you what the glass, what the burn's like before they decide to transfer? I'm sure there are questions of whether or not they should transfer at some hospitals. No, definitely. I mean, currently we, we, have, we go old-fashioned email. We'll have the folks at the, you know, the other countries take pictures with digital cameras. So uh, it's great to see you know, once they can afford the Google Glass technology to be able to use it that way, definitely. So that might be happening. Well, okay. Um, Paul, anything else uh, you want to add? No, I was just going to, um, Phil, do you know uh, Karandeep Singh or Sino Do? Uh, Karandeep, yeah, I met. I, I, met. I just want to make sure because they're, they're the guys that are actually kind of Leading the charge in a lot of this, and they're right there at your, you know, at MGH. So I, just, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. I didn't mention it before. It's great. Yeah, he's he is definitely really run with this by far within our system. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's probably as far as integrating an EMR, he's probably farther along than anybody I've seen so far, and definitely working hard to do it. And uh, um, you know, but like I said, I think that it's a great opportunity to, uh, for you there. And uh, I think it, when you look at what can glass be used in today, I think there's there's very few things. Um, and I think that what you're talking about is is one of them that it could be. And it could be actually a useful tool because uh, you know folks are even using like the iPads. Like I said, and they'll go in there and like hold it up over the patient, or you know they have their you know this is something that could potentially, uh, it's a nice hands-free thing that's it's a simple use that could use the streaming or even just, you know, um, simply the recording, you know what I mean? Like uh, you could have the nurse record the dressing change mm -hmm. so that you can have a record of it each day, what the progress of the burn is, you know what I mean, and, and, and record that somewhere. Uh, obviously that has to deal with all those HIPAA issues and everything, but um, a lot of places are doing that already with, with you know, phones and you know, and, and different things like that, or or cameras. So it's just a thought. Um, hopefully, it kind of helps you out there. I think it's a great thing. I'm going to try to talk with one of my my nurse managers to see if we can come up with a little trial. Try that exactly because I hadn't thought of using it that way before. So I, I think it's a phenomenal idea. I'll make sure you get credit. If you I know that's right. So yeah. So I mean, I'd be happy to like let you you know check out and test the the application. It's not HIPAA compliant per se yet. We have one that actually is that we haven't uh, launched yet, but um, it'd be kind of fun to, to play around with it and uh, and see if it's something that you think would be useful there. Uh, um, it works on an iPhone or an iPad is really the best way to, to do it. Um, and so uh, as long as you got an open network of Wi-Fi there, we can, we can try and play around with it. Like I said, it's not quite HIPAA compliant yet, but uh, I think I'd be glad to let you try it out and have fun with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested. Thank you. I just have one quick question, and maybe I don't know. Maybe this is a dumb question, but uh, I've read some about uh, some studies being done on 3D 3D printed skin. Uh, are you using that at all, uh, Philip? Um, for, so graf for grafting? No, not at this time. The best technology we have available is we can culture epithelium, so uh, what we call CEA. That technology has been around since the late 80s. Um, it is frightfully expensive. To grow enough CEA or culture epithelial skin to cover, say, a typical adult arm would be $80,000. And the quality of skin you get, because it's only epithelium, is terrible. It blisters really easily. There's a high rate of graft loss. So at this time, we only use it for burn patients who are greater than 80% burned area, and we're just desperate. Um, it can save a life, but the quality of life is not very good with it. Okay, so there's not much going on there yet. Um, I, now, there are some things going on in, kind of at the trial level. There's definitely some folks doing tissue engineering at Mass General who are de decellularizing dermis and then repopulating it with patients' own stem cells. And I have heard some talk about using a 3D printer to build a kind of an artificial dermal matrix, but I haven't heard anyone actually kind of bring it to clinical trial. I think there is a lot of talk about how to make that to work. Um, it's an area that is dying for improvement because, frankly, that culture of skin is over three decades old, and there has been a paucity of new breakthroughs recently. So I think it's, a, it's something that, that I did. I know people have been talking about. I suspect a couple of folks are using but no one's really made a lot of headway yet. Okay, there's a lot of work to be done. Well, okay, uh, thanks a lot for coming by, Paul. And, uh, Philip, yeah. thanks, thanks for the great presentation. And uh, uh, hopefully we can use this platform uh, to talk to other burn surgeons around the world. 
<laughs> so hold on, guys. I have to stop the broadcast. So uh, goodbye to everyone. Goodbye to the audience. I'm going to stop the broadcast. Bye, everybody. <laughs>